Praise the Lord, everybody. My name is Pastor Tyrone P. Jones IV, and I want to welcome you to First Baptist Church of Guilford, House of Faith, where we believe in preaching, teaching, reaching, and healing. Our director of music has come up with a song that says we are gathered to worship him, to lift up our voices in praise. We're glad you have joined us in celebration to God Almighty, wonderful Savior, Lord of Lord, to him who is the King of Kings. We welcome you to First Baptist Church. Thank you for coming today. God be praised. This service is a service designed so that we can worship the Lord to get the word and go out to serve. Thank you for joining us today. Come on back and see us anytime. But right now, let's get ready to go into worship. give God praise one more time. Thank you, Sister Seals, for blessing us this morning. C.C. Winans penned a great song when she wrote that. Amen. We greet you with Jesus' joy on this morning, thanking God our Father for another opportunity to be in his presence and to lift up his word. We're still in the book of James. Amen. Book of James chapter 3 today. I want to read in your hearing verses 1 through 12. We're still in the midst of our series, Living This Kind of Life. <clears throat> it's going to take us through the month of July. And so uh, we're going to go forth with the word. James chapter 3, beginning at verse 1 and ending at verse 12. If you have it, say amen. Amen. Here begins the reading of God's word. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into our mouths, into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although, al although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest, what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come, comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may have your seats. I ask you to assume a posture of prayers for the next few moments that are mine to share. I want to talk about twisting tongues of fire. Twisting tongues of fire. Let's pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we come now to this moment of preaching. 
Thank you, Lord God, for Pastor Horace Huff stopping by the 8 o'clock service to bless us. Now, God, I need a double portion of your anointing in this worship experience. God, give me all that I might need to preach with power and clarity in this place. We thank you in advance for what your word shall accomplish. Bless us now, God. And this is sermonic venture. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. Living this kind of life, twisting tongues of fire. Love it again, the book of James looks at every part of our existence. In fact, I believe James takes a very introspective look at who we are as individual believers and makes sure that every aspect of our lives are covered when it comes to our faithful fellowship in Jesus Christ. And James, to be sure, makes sure that every area is lining up with the kind of life that you and I should be living. Last week, we talked about the practice of faith and being able to discern the right kind of faith because we remember the thesis scripture from the, for the entire book of James is in James chapter 1, verse 12, where it says the following words, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive a crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When you persevere under trial and when you stand the test, that person will receive the crown of life, especially to the ones that love the Lord. So we remember that trials produce endurance or perseverance and that the testing of our faith puts to puts our faith into practice. And so it's important, beloved, that we understand and know that on one hand, there are the things that God allows in our lives. And God allows all kinds of trials to come about in our lives, to produce perseverance so that we're able to keep moving and pressing and marching. But then God also says there is the testing of your faith so that you and I can put into practice what we believe, putting into practice every day of our lives how we're supposed to faithfully follow the Lord. So in chapter 3, a part of the practice of our faith is making sure that we know the difference between ambition versus submission. Tell a neighbor, ambition versus submission. Amen. Ambition versus submission. Now watch it. All ambition should be tempered and tamed by submission unto God. Now there's nothing wrong with ambition or being an ambitious individual, but a part of the practice of our faith that informs the way that we should live is by, fact, by the fact that everything should be under godly submission. There ought not be any tight target or goal that you're trying to reach that has not put under submission to the will of Almighty God. Everything we do ought to be submitted to God's will so that it can become God approved and so it can become God allowed. And it's important, beloved, that we notice this and understand this, that selfish ambition can cause us to go places where God really doesn't want us to go. I'm going to say that again. Selfish ambition can cause us to go places where God does not necessarily want us to go because if it's all about your ambition for your goals and what you want to do with your life, and you're not submitting what you're doing unto God so that God can be pleased with the outcome of what you're trying to accomplish, then it's really all for naught. Everything should be under godly submission. Let me prove my point. Let's just say I didn't preach. Verse 1, keep your Bibles open so you can see I didn't make, make, make anything up. Bible says, not many of you 
should become teachers. That's what James is saying, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, it's important to understand what James is saying here in the text, that the office of a teacher is a prestigious office. It is a prestigious position. In fact, beloved, under uh, 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 the Jewish rites, a rabbi, one who was called a teacher of God, was one who had respect of his peers and respect of the people in in the community. In fact, a rabbi, you were blessed if you were called to carry a rabbi's bags. I'm not making it up. If you were called to carry a rabbi's bags, you were blessed because you were in the vicinity of one who possessed knowledge that comes straight from God. It was a very prestigious position. And so the position of prestige impacted a lot of people. And so a rabbi or teacher meant that their position and their power produced prestige. But James is taking note here that the position of the Jewish rabbi was carrying over to the Christian teacher. And so the Christian teacher was the one who was now moving forward from the Judean practices, the Jewish practices of the past, and now because they're faithful followers of Jesus Christ, during the time of the New Testament, that teachers were still held to a high standard, even the Christian teachers. In fact, in the days of the Apostle Paul, the Christian worship service was a spontaneous worship service. In fact, anyone who claimed to have godly knowledge could stand up in worship and take a turn to teach in front of the crowd. Anyone that said, I have godly knowledge, could stand up and teach in front of the crowd. I'm not making it up. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. Write that down. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 says this. What shall we say, brothers and sisters, When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation or a tongue or an interpretation. But Paul says this, everything must be done so that the church may be built up. In fact, beloved, you can't just go about worship all willy-nilly. Got to make sure that there is order in the church. And that's what the Apostle Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But what's important to understand in regards to teaching is that anyone who say they have the knowledge could be brought forward to present that knowledge before the body. But Paul says beware because if you're called up to speak in front of the body, you better know what you're talking about. You better know what you're saying because we got a whole lot of people in the world today that like the limelight of being up front and like the limelight of being seen and espousing what they believe personally without taking into effect and understanding that this must be the word of God to edify the body. It's never about the individual giving the information as much as it's about the people receiving the information. It's about the body of Christ being built up. So here, going back to James, James is warning, be careful of the seductive ambition of becoming a teacher because many have been tempted by the title. Boy, it got quiet. Many have been tempted by the title. He says, be careful. Why be careful? Because teachers and preachers will be judged more strictly than anyone else because you have claimed that you have knowledge of God and have espoused that knowledge to someone else. So so I love this because James included himself among the teachers who were to be warned. And and notice, if you will, uh, the contradiction here that that to be a teacher-preacher but not practice what you preach is a major contradiction in the house of God. To be a teacher-preacher but to not live what you preach 
is a major, major contradiction. It, it, it's, it's, it's like this. It's like a doctor who neglects their own health. Somebody who works on other people but don't work on themselves. It, 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 it's, it's like an accountant who, who, who can't balance their own books. It, it, it's kind of uh, like an attorney who's in trouble with the law. Okay, there's, it's like a mechanic uh, whose car never runs. It's a dangerous thing to say and proclaim that you are such a person, an individual, an expert, someone who has is, is knowledge, but if you don't put that into practice yourself, how then can you stand before the people and say you have the knowledge of God? So, so, so beloved, here it is. If Christian teachers are driven more by ambition and not given into total submission, that's a dangerous place to be in because those who claim to be teachers and preachers and pastors will be judged more strictly than anybody else. And that's why you got to take what you do seriously when it comes to the word of God and the impartation of the word. But watch it. Teachers use their tongues in order to teach. So even if you think ambition, you need to talk submission. Even if you're thinking about your own self-aggrandizement and being in certain circles and being in prestigious positions, you need to make sure that that is tempered by your submission. Lord, what is your will for my life that you might be pleased with my service? What is your will for my life, Lord God, so that you might use me to be a blessing to somebody else? And James makes it clear. Keep your Bibles open. And he's not just talking about teachers alone. Look at verse 2. But he says, we all stumble in many ways. James included himself. He says, we all stumble. Everybody stumbles, whether spiritually or physically, we all stumble. In fact, is there anybody in here that can declare that I've I've had mishaps in my life. I've, I've not been perfect. I've not gotten it all right. I've not said the right thing at the right time. I've, not, I've had some stumbles in my life. So James gives an account that even if you're not a teacher who will be strictly judged by what you teach the people of God, that all of us in many ways stumble. But the one place, God help me, that we stumble the most is in our speech. It's in our speech. We stumble the most in our speech because, beloved, let's be real in the church, everybody's speech all the time is not spirit speech. Y'all mighty quiet this morning. I'm gonna keep preaching, amen. Everybody's speech all the time is not spirit speech. You're not always talking about the Lord all the time. Okay, I got some people over here, amen. You're not always talking about the Bible all the time. And so all of us come into a place where we're all stumbling physically or spiritually, especially in our speech, because we're not always using our tongue to talk about God or his goodness. There are times, if we're honest, we let other things slip in to our conversations. There, there are times, beloved, you can tell Amen, those times when somebody calls you and, the, and if the first thing they ask you is, am I on speaker? You know the next thing that's going to be said is not about spirit speech. Come on, be real. They about to tell you something juicy about somebody else that y'all know and y'all really don't know the business of the individuals that y'all talking about in the first place. The reality is we don't always talk the way that we should. So beloved, the Bible is letting us know that we need to tame the tongue and tame how we talk and that we can keep 
every, if we can do that, we can keep every aspect of our lives in check. Look at the B clause of verse 2. It says that if you claim in some ways to be perfect, and he's not talking about perfect meaning sinless, but he's talking about perfect being spiritually mature. He said if you, in some way you can do that, that then, then you'll be able to keep the whole body in check. James says perfection is, 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 is not what you think it is. It's not about being sinless as much as it's about being spiritually mature and self-controlled and self-disciplined. It's about being spiritually mature to understand that some of the talk that's not spirit speech ought to be lessened in my life so that I can be closer to doing the things that God has called me to do. That God knows we're going to stumble, but Lord, let me stumble less in my life so that I can be stronger in doing your will. James says that teachers ought to tame their tongue because of selfish ambition. Selfish ambition over spiritual submission is a dangerous place. And that everybody stumbles, but we ought to make sure that we are more spiritually mature. But can I go deeper in the text? The Bible lets us know that the twisting tongues that were within our bodies are tiny, but the tiny twist of the tongue is filled with terror. Tiny twist of the tongue is filled with terror. Be, be, be aware that small sparks spread beyond oneself. Small sparks spread beyond oneself. What am I saying? Teachers will be judged more strictly because they claim they have the knowledge of God. We all stumble, but we must become more spiritually mature. But the tongue is small. But how many know the tongue is still very strong? That little quarter pound piece of flesh in your mouth is small covered with all kinds of membranes that give you various taste buds, but, but, but that, that little piece of flesh in your mouth is small, but it's strong. And so you've got to learn to tame the tongue if you're going to be in submission to grow spiritually in the Lord. The tongue is small, but very strong. And what James does, watch verses three through five, is he gives examples, really illustrations of, of, of just how powerful the small tongue is. He talks about, and I'll summarize it for you, a small bit that can control a powerful horse. He talks about a small rudder that controls the direction of a large ship. And he talks about a small fire that can destroy an entire forest. That, that's right here in verses three through five. I just summarized it for you, that, 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 that a small bit can control a powerful horse. A small rudder can control the direction of a large ship and small fire can destroy a large forest. Now let's look at the horse for a second. If you control the mouth of the horse, then the rider can control the body of the horse and the direction in which the horse can go. So what James is saying is this. If you and I can control our ever-twisting tongue, then we can take control of our lives and the direction in which the Lord wants to lead us. Because tap your neighbor, some of y'all need a bit in your mouth. Some of y'all need a bit in your mouth. You need something to control what you say. You, you need a little something to bridle you so that you can go in the right direction because some of y'all unbridled and some of y'all without the bit in your mouth, amen. Woo, a whole lot of loose lips. And y'all know what that does, loose lips sink ships, amen, there it is. Uh, uh, in the 1930s, I'm gonna just give you this fun fact, the largest horse in the world was a horse by the name of Brooklyn Supreme. They called it Brookie for support, for short. Brooklyn Supreme, you can look it up. It weighed 3,200 pounds and the horse stood 
19.2 hands tall. I don't know what hands tall mean, but that's what it was. It was a pure bred Belgian stallion, and it lived for 20 years. It died in 1948. This horse was massive. It was huge. It was tall. But the one thing about Brookie, Brooklyn Supreme, was that all that mass and all that height and all the longevity of the horse, all of that was controlled by a two-pound bit that was in the mouth of the horse. That small little piece is what connected and gave direction to the horse. How many of us, if we just take a little bit of the word and bridle it in our mouths, learn to take a little bit of scripture, just, just a couple of sentences from the Holy Writ and put it in your mouth when you want to say one thing, but you turn around and say something else, it will go a long way in giving you a course correction to make sure you're on the right path with God. Anybody know that a little bit of the word every morning will bridle what you say. A little bit of the word every morning, every evening will cause you to think on the things of God more often. It'll help you every step of the way. But watch this. It also says, verse 4, that a small rudder controls a large ship when strong winds come. Here's what James is talking about. He talks about how small things can decide great direction. How small things can decide great direction. Uh, just like a small piece of flesh in your mouth can decide all the direction of humanity or humanity in history. When you think about it, when you think about the Branch Davidian compound and, and how one so-called spiritual leader can speak words to people who would follow in mass and these people died in a fire. Uh, when, you, when you think about in Guyana, Jim Jones, Followers following every word that he spoke because how many know that the word from one person can move masses of people to do certain things? See, words can decide the direction in which you go and the word from someone who claims they are an authority can sometimes propel you and guide you in your life. But the twisting tongue can not only drive us like a bit, it, twisting tongue can not only detour us like a ship, but the twisting tongue can also destroy us like a spark of a fire. So, uh, so you see, a tiny spark can set a forest on fire. Y'all know this, for the past several weeks, we've been experiencing a haze in the mid-Atlantic states due to fires that are taking place all the way in Ontario, Canada. All the way in Canada, the fire, the smoke has made its way due to the winds pressing it down to, to cause a orange haze glow to come over the city of New York and to cause a haze to come even right here in Maryland where you can taste the, the, the fire and, and soot in the air. It, it, it's the same way. When stuff starts small, it does not only affect you, but it affects everybody else around you. So when you say what I'm doing is only affecting me, the devil is a liar, it's affecting everybody else around you because you have a sphere of influence. There are people that are around you, that watch you, that see you, that view you, and when you speak a small spark that causes a fire, it can burn down an entire forest. Just like one word can ruin one's reputation. Just like one word can ruin somebody's life. But watch it. James is telling us that if you don't control the twisting tongue and tame it, it will drive us, it will detour us, 
It will ultimately strive to destroy us. But then verse 6 says, it will ultimately defile us. Keep your Bibles open. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. What, what James has given us here is the imagery of really a wheel of fire. A wheel of fire. In ancient times, uh, there were wooden chariots that were being driven in ancient times. And sometimes if the, the chariot's axles, which were made of wood, lost its lubrication, the chafe of the wooden axle would then grind to cause a fire. And the result would be a fire that would burn in the axle, which would then spread to the rim, which would ultimately consume the wheel, which would ultimately consume the chariot. And so it would all start with the spark that came in the axle, which led to the destruction of the entire wooden chariot. James is saying that the source of this kind of fire comes from hell itself. And this kind of fire is what is known as Gehenna. Gehenna. G-E-H-E-N-N-A. Gehenna. And this is the only place outside of the Gospels where you will see this word, where you will see this form of hell, which is a continuous burning of a non-containable combustible substance that's what hell the lake of fire is it is a continuous place of burning it is a place that is going to ultimately have those who will be consumed by hell fire and this lifts up that nothing else could cause this kind of flame but a flame that comes from hell itself but for every, God help me, for every flame that comes from hell, that comes to set our lives, our tongues on fire, which then sets our body parts on fire, which then sets our lives on fire, for every flame that comes from hell, thank God, hallelujah, that there's a tongue that can be set on fire for, from heaven as well. See, see, just as there's a flame that comes from hell, there's a flame that comes from heaven. And so what you've got to do is choose among the competing natures that are striving for your attention. You, you've got to make a choice where you are that I'm choosing the fire that comes from heaven versus the fire that comes from hell. Y'all looking at me straight. Let me see if I can prove my point here. In Acts chapter 2. And James was there as well in the upper room. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that cloven tongues of fire rested on every believer in the upper room. And these Pentecostal tongues of fire could bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ because they were on one accord, God help me, in one place, being about the business of the kingdom of God. And they became flaming, fiery witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. See, I love this, beloved, because the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, controlled their tongues to the place where they were able to speak languages that they didn't even know. And they were able to go outside and speak in unknown tongues to draw those who were visiting Jerusalem during the high holy days in to know about Jesus Christ. See, the, the, here's the thing. You got to determine, I want Holy Ghost to control my tongue versus the fires of hell controlling my tongue. I want Jesus controlling my tongue versus anything else in this life. But watch it. When we give the Lord control, hallelujah, of our tongues, what he will do is he'll drown out what's trying to drive you. He will derail what's trying to detour us. He will detach us, God help me, from, from things that are trying to destroy us. And that's something we ought to give God praise for. 
that the very things that were trying to devour us, to defile us, God says, God says the Holy Ghost has the power to give you what you need to combat the flames of hell that are trying to stick to your tongue. See, when you wake up in the morning, there are two natures that are striving for your attention. When you wake up in the morning, there are the imps that come from hell that are trying to say, stay in the bed. You don't need to get up this morning and go to church. You don't need to go. It's a holiday weekend. It's an extended. Everybody at the Essence Festival anyway. Everybody out there smoking marijuana. Amen. Because July 1st, it was open season in the state of Maryland. You don't need to go to church today. But for every hellish demon that's whispering in your ear, how many know that there are angels in heaven? That's another nature that says, get out of bed this morning because God has been good to you get out of bed this morning and turn on that TV and give God some praise anybody thankful for the cloven tongues of fire that still spark in our tongues that God's glory might be revealed oh I'm almost done y'all sit down one second please here it is here it is it's important to know that there are two forces, two natures that are striving for your attention. There are two forces and two natures that are striving to see what you're going to do. There are two forces and two natures always looking and trying to approach you. Here's the thing, who you gonna entertain? Who you gonna entertain? See, this is what we got to learn to do. Can I give you something practical? And then I'm moving on to my last point. Can I give you something practical? When so-and-so calls you, and says is this a secure lie or if so and so calls you and say am I on speaker you shut that foolishness down right then and there and say not today in fact beloved if you want to be just as belligerent and if you want to say something that I don't want to be causing no kind of fisticuffs or nothing but you tell them not today devil <laughs> not today devil <laughs> and then you tell them I got to go or if they keep on talking that foolishness you hang up I ain't say slam the phone down I just said hang it up so that you can determine I'm going to stay on the side of God so that I can begin to do everything that God wants me to do. And this is the reason why. Here's the last thing. This is the reason why you need the flame of the Holy Spirit to combat the flames of hell. Because verse 8 says, look at verse 8, that no human being can contain the tongue it is a restless, twisting tongue full of deadly poison. Is that what's in your Bible? That's what's in my Bible. So here's the question. Here's the question for Bible readers. The question is, if we can't contain it, if I can't tame the tongue, why try? If I can't contain it, if I can't do something with it, why try? Watch it. James is not saying that we can't tame the tongue, but what James is really saying is that you can't tame the tongue by yourself. You and I need God on a daily basis to help us with how we live. You and I need God on a daily basis to help us so that we can navigate this world and do all that God has called us to do. I'm going to give you this quick story and I'm done. There's some strange delicacies out there in the world. In Japan, the strange delicacy is called fuju. It's really the delicacy of a puffer fish. Now, this puffer fish is a strange delicacy in Japan because you have to have specialized chefs to know how to really cut up this puffer fish because it contains within the puffer fish over 270 times what regular cyanide will do to the body. There's deadly poison in the puffer fish. But there are people in Japan that still want to eat it. Now, I don't know about y'all. 
But once I found out about the toxins and the deadly poison that's in the fish, I ain't trying to eat no poison. I ain't trying to eat nothing that's going to take me out of here. I ain't trying to eat nothing that's going to cause, cause no issues or no problems. But there are special chefs, God help me, that know how to circumnavigate around the, the, the various areas in the puffer fish so that the fish can be consumed. Here it is, you need the Holy Ghost to help you in times of danger and in times where there's deadly poison all around you and times where there's vitriol and where there's words that are spewed that are going to try to affect your system. You need the Holy Ghost to be that holy chef to cut out the deadly parts that are trying to kill you. Hallelujah. Let's review and I'm done. James told us that the tongue acts as a fire. James told us that it can stain the body, that it can act like a beast. I didn't get to that part. I had to skip over that. And that it is a deadly poison. And so then wise people who practice their faith ought to know how to prevent fires, remove stains, cage beast and hold back deadly poison. Wise believers have to do the same thing with their words or they'll ultimately be guilty of contradictions. That's what's happening in verses 9 through 12. He's listing for us contradictions in relationship to the tongue and how we speak. See, James lifts up, listen, look, watch this. James lifts up great contradictions of the tongue and why we always need the tongue to be tamed. Verse 9 10 says that out of one mouth comes multiple messages. Out of one mouth, there is the blessings that go to God the Father, but out of that same mouth, there is the cursing that takes place to those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. How in the world? On Sunday, you can praise God with that mouth. Then Monday through Saturday, the same person is probably in the same church. If they stomp your toe, you ready to lay them out. Blessings and cursings come from the mouth. Oh, what a contradiction. He says in verse 11, verse 11, that fresh water and salt water comes from different places. But when it comes to the fact that we have one mouth because of the competing natures that are vying for our attention, there are times that there are some good things that could come out of our mouths and there are some not so good things that can come out of our mouths. James is saying that fresh water and salt water ought not mix. Verse 12 says that fig trees, God help me, can't bear olives and grapevines can't produce figs. Salt springs can't produce fresh water. Yet the tongue has a great contradiction. It can produce blessings and cursings from the same mouth. But can I give you a remedy for that? The remedy is in Proverbs 18, 21. Bible says death and life is in the power of the tongue. Tell a neighbor, speak life. When death tries to come and invade your tongue, speak life. When there are some dead situations that try to encroach upon your life, speak life. Speak life in such a way that you're overwhelmingly positive even in a pessimistic and negative situation. Learn to speak life even in the midst of whatever you're facing in life, knowing that even though it may look not look like what it should be, that God is already working on my case. Tell a neighbor, speak life. Joseph had to learn to speak life. The Bible says that he was put in a pit by his brothers. 
sold into slavery, made an indentured servant to Potiphar, wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife, thrown in jail. But if he hadn't gone in the pits, and if he hadn't worked for Potiphar, he would have never met the cupbearer in prison. And it was the cupbearer who remembered him after the interpretation of his dream that he was able to interpret the dream of Pharaoh and became second in command but then he tested his brothers to see if they really going to be devoted to me and my favorite scripture in Genesis is Genesis 50 20 what you meant for evil God turned around and turned it for my good is there anybody that can testify in a dead situation you didn't know if you're going to rise to meet the challenge but because Oh, you begin to speak every day over your life that God's going to have God's way that in the end God worked it out for your good let me give you this and I'm gone the central park five now the exonerated five it is there that they were falsely accused of raping someone in, in the New York City in the, in the park in 1989 Yusuf Salam was only 15 years old and it was there that he got 70 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit there were certain people who remained nameless who took out ads in 1989 full page ads said send them to the gas chamber kill him on sight because of a falsely ac accused accusation that went to them Yusuf was 15 in 1989 but here it is after they were exonerated 34 years later that Yusuf Salam wins the New York City Council Democratic primary and he says of his situation I'm able to repurpose my pain and use it as a platform to help other people climb out of their despair. Is there anybody out there? You've gone to hell and back. You've been through some situations in your life, but God exonerated you, gave you a new lease on life, and where people condemn you, God elevated you and put you on the precipice of doing great things for the kingdom of God. Somebody ought to give God praise and use your tongue to repurpose your pain and help other people rise from their despair. Give God some praise today. Hallelujah. 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 It may look bad now, but just keep speaking life. It may not look like what you're looking for, but just keep speaking life. Speak life over your children, life over your business, life over your body, life over your household, life over everything around you, life over your family life over people that talk about you life over everything use that tongue because the power of death and life is in the tongue listen I'm done but don't let nobody force you to receive that nature that sends us to a place and connects us to a place where God doesn't want us to be. Just as there are fiery flames that come from hell. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost has fiery flames from heaven. And Bear Grylls taught us this, that fire can't burn where fire's already been. Think about that. If the fire of God is there, prior to the fire of hell 
then you've got a precedent that is already in place that all I need to do is go back to the place where I connected with God and learn to speak life with your tongue. So let's stop all the gossip. Ooh, it got quiet. Let's stop all the talk that's not spirit speech. I know we don't speak spirit all the time. God knows all of us are prone to stumble. It's right here in the book. But Lord, let me do less of what I used to do so that I can be in a better position to give your name glory, honor, and praise. Let me be better in the way that I live. Let me be better in the way that I talk. Let me be better in how I interact with others. 